We'd like to welcome Richard Honigman to the Haight Ashbury Oral Video Project. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Rebecca Nichols. I'll be moderating this interview. Um, let's start from the beginning. Where were you born, Richard? I was born in New York, in the East Bronx. And your parents, their names? Uh, Henry and Jean, and they were the first born in America in their family. Oh, and where were their parents from? Uh, mother's side from Russia, father's side from Nepal. What type of work were your family in? My father was a factory worker, was a factory foreman. We were working class, people did the housing project. Um, when you were growing up, do you have brothers and sisters? I have one brother. What was his name? Michael. Michael. Um, do you have any children? I have a stepson. What's your stepson's name? Rusty. Rusty. Um, you were growing up and going to school in New York? Yes. Um, and as you got a little bit older, we were talking earlier, you got inspired to the bigger and better things. Well, yeah, uh, growing up working class, growing up poor in New York is not exactly a picnic. And the Bronx is a very grim place. There are many trees, and there's a lot of red brick. And I remember staring out the window in the second grade, all the brick all around me, and thinking about how my father would come home every day with an axe buried in his forehead because he worked in a metal stamping plant and it was all this clanging and banging and noise and then the politics of the factory and the politics of the office you know, grinding him down to a pulp and I said the movies I look at movies and TV and it's all beautiful it's in California there's motorcycles there's sports cars there's this beautiful country there's this other kind of life that's where I'm going and so uh, I had a plan from seven years old on to uh, to uh, grow up and get out. And um, I skipped two and a half years of school, uh, just just rapidly as possible. Sure. And uh, got out of high school at 15 and a half and uh, packed my bags and said goodbye. Where'd you go? Greenwich Village. And what started happening there for you? Well, the East Village in the late 50s and early 60s was a phenomenal place. It was sort of the Haight-Ashbury in miniature which is why I understood when the Haight-Ashbury started heating up what was about to happen. Right. But never realizing it would become 10 times, 100 times larger than the East Village was. Sure. But the East Village was a place of, in order to have Bohemia, you must have cheap rent. Right. Which is why Bohemia is so shrunken today. And why kids getting out of school can't just go wander around and right. find themselves. Because right. they've got to pay the college loans off and they're, they're hung up in high rent. Uh, look what Marin County's become, look what San sure. Francisco's become, Santa Barbara, sure. Los Angeles, sure. the west side of L.A., which were all enclaves for people like ourselves, the East Village itself. You can get what it. I paid $25 sure. for it, for an apartment in the East Village is today $2,500. Amazing. I had a loft for, for 90 bucks, and Amazing. downstairs for me was uh, Walter Boart, who started the East Village Other. And I helped him start the East Village Other along with Alan Katzman. About how old are you here? Uh... I was a teenager. Teenager. Yeah, 17. And I was going to different schools. I dropped out of regular college and started going to the new school in the Art Students League and um, set myself up in a loft and I was an abstract expressionist painter ah. um, for uh, a number of years in the village. And, um, and uh, in order to live, what most of us did was put ads in the Village Voice, which at the time was 25 pages instead of the 150-page tome that it is today. And we all had moving companies and a telephone, and you'd be ABC movers for a couple of months until the PUC caught up with you, or the <laughs> ICC. And because New York is really a third-world country, you would just pay them off and go back in business the next week as XYZ movers. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and people would call you up at 2 and 3 in the morning trying to sneak out on their husbands or their wives. Hey, can you come over and move me right away? Sure, man. You call up a couple of friends and you run over to your truck and you move them. That's right. And uh, that's how everyone lived. That was underground life. It was village sure. moving. And there was hundreds, hundreds, thousands of us involved uh, in village moving. And um, yeah. and so, uh, but I still had this, this gnawing need to go to California. Sure. So I went out for the first time when I was 18. Had you touched film at all at this point? I hadn't though? touched film yet, no. But you still loved it. Yes, I was involved in graphic art, but I wasn't involved in film. And um, I was um, I was also um, uh, a 
relative had gotten me into the concrete workers' union, and I was also building skyscrapers. And uh, three months of that, you could live on the money for a year. So sure. it was very good money. But one day, in I was in the February day, I urinated on a column in 18 degree weather, and I watched my 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 piss freeze <laughs> within three feet going down the column. And I said, "This is too much. I'm not going <laughs> to spend another winter in New York." <laughs> and so that Saturday, I left and uh, went to California and uh, visited some relatives in Los Angeles, and then drove up the coast of San Francisco. What was this, about uh, what year? 1963. And then where'd you go? I went to North Beach, and... Uh, what was going on there? I went to City Lights book, Bookshop, and uh, saw an ad to rent a room, and I rented a room on Grant Avenue, uh, and... Um, what was the scene like? Well, it was... North Beach. It, it was kind of like the village in that it was warmed over, memory of what beatniks once were, uh, it was over. And I'm of a, of a split generation that was later called Gen Xers 20 years later, but there were Gen Xers in the late 50s and early 60s, and our name for ourselves were freaks, because we felt like we were freaks. Psychologically, spiritually, emotionally, we were not freaked out, we were just freaks. We weren't normal, we knew we were not normal people. We were all reading Krishnamurti. We were all we were all studying all the spiritualists. We were all discovering Madame Blavatsky. We were all discovering Aurobindo. We were all discovering an autobiography of a yogi. We were all finding out what yoga was all about, what meditation was all about, macrobiotic cooking. There used to be a macro uh, a microbiotic restaurant on Seventh and First Avenue that was a, a big scene in the village. So everyone discovered brown rice for the first time. I mean, these are New Yorkers. We're not, we weren't used to fresh vegetables and sure. stuff like that. I mean, didn't understand it. I had never seen an avocado until I was 18. That's right. I didn't know what one was. I didn't either. And um, so, um, and I enjoyed California very much. I stayed, I lived and worked here for three or four months. But I had things to finish up in New York, so I sure. hitch, hitchhiked back to New York. And over the next year and a half, I bounced back and forth three, four, five, six times, either driving or hitchhiking. And the end of 1964, I moved out here for good. You had some, some, uh, Bill Graham had the film Art East, I think it was 69 through 71. You right. had some history with that building before that. Yes. Um, there was a meeting, Abby Hoffman came out, I was already on the Oracle staff, and uh, Abby Hoffman came out um, after the idea was born here in the West Coast. Um, um, Martine reminded us of it earlier. Um, uh, it went, you know, we were all calling each other and talking to each other. What was the forth. mission? What was the project? The mission was, uh, the, it was the first big Pentagon demonstration. And what we wanted to do was lift the Pentagon up off the ground and twirl it on its axis. <laughs> and uh, so we invited uh, shamans and medicine men and curanderas and curanderos and every, everyone we could that we thought was magic. To, uh, because the Vietnam War was such an ugly, awful thing that went on year after year, and every permutation was worse and worse. So we thought that by magic and by spiritualism, maybe we could stop it that way. Right. And uh, so I was uh, somehow voted upon, appointed, uh, somehow they got together and figured, since I knew New York, um, and yet was fully recognized in my California incarnation, I would be the, uh, the the California Oracle Digger Haight Ashbury representative to the Pentagon, and um, and I, Abby and I got along well, and also I was connected to the East Village other people. Right. So that was an important uh, uh, venue for me to be able to work out. So you had an event? Huh? This was an event. Uh, no. Well, the the, the 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 Pentagon certainly yes. was an event. We, we we brought close to a couple hundred thousand people there. And where did it take place? It took place at the Pentagon. But we planned it in New York and operated out of New York. Gotcha. With meetings in Washington. And in order to get my bands out from the West Coast... So they, you were managing some bands at the I time? I wasn't managing bands, but I knew them. Right. And I, and I asked them, would they come to New York if I could get them there? And they said yes. But they, like many people in the Haight-Ashbury, they had no political consciousness. The Haight-Ashbury was a very strange mixture of people with spiritual consciousness 
political consciousness, political and spiritual consciousness, but 90% of the people were there partying and having a good time. And finding love and right, finding peace. Right, right. Like with any group At of Berkeley. people, only 10% are going to be intellectual, sure. intellectually inclined, uh, well-read, literate, sure. and understand history and politics. Of course. And so, Do you think that became a split and then those more politically minded went to Berkeley, to People's Park? And did you, did I you, think you'd find the same split in Berkeley that you'd find here, even though you have a college there. Sure. So you have an intellectualism built in. Uh, still, a lot of people that go to college don't really have an intellectual sure. framework in their mind. Sure. They're there to, to, to digest these books and learn how to make a living later. Right. Uh, is why they're there. So even in Berkeley you find that split. Uh, I certainly find it now when I'm living in Santa Barbara at uh, the University of uh, sure. California, Santa Barbara. Did you find like-minded people of your um, more intellectual, more... I mean, did you Here? feel you could make a difference? Yes. Yes. Well, that's why I was on the staff of the Oracle and, and uh, uh, worked with Peter Berg and the Diggers and David Grogan. And, Do you have uh, any stories? Do you have any stories oh, we can no. talk about? Because you stories of Legion. Tell uh, us one. We'd love well, to hear it. Uh, there were many communes set up all over the city, and um, uh, a, a, a different commune a day would be picked to, to, to make the free food in the park. And just trying to, uh, I mean, everything was always done on no money. And so just trying to organize it for, the, for that day took a week to get the food together, to get it cooked, to get it prepared, to try and have some kind of sanitary conditions, and to find out who really knew how to cook. Um, uh, a lot of people said they did, but they couldn't. And uh, how to make something, how to make health food edible. How many people were they cooking for? Oh, usually a few hundred a day. Right. And, uh, and that became uh, an interesting theme through my life because eventually I ended up with a health food restaurant. Wow. Uh, when I got back from India. Wow. And in India, I ended up cooking for hundreds of people wow. uh, during the Bangladesh War. Wow. Uh, I was in Calcutta helping the Mukti Bahini in their war and running food out to the concentration camps because the, the, uh, the Muslim Bangladeshis threw out the Hindu Bangladeshis, not trusting them. Sure. And the Hindu Indians in Calcutta didn't want any more poor people. It's enough of, of millions sure. of people living on the street. So these people now had no country, no home, no farm, no nothing. Right. And um, I try to work with the Gandhi Peace Foundation and try to work with um, different uh, Christian charitable groups and the United Nations, and none of them knew what they were doing. None of them understood. No. Uh, you really needed a graduate degree from the streets of the city of New York. The people making the rules had no idea right. the, the I extent. Had, I had already lived need. in Mexico and understood corruption in the third world, and I'd grown up in New York and understood corruption in the third world because I was New York. That's and right. so. Um, I was able to run uh, five or six loads of food out to the camps in a broken down old Volkswagen bus. And uh, you had to do it in a certain way, otherwise they would grab you and mob you and tear at your clothing and your money. So you had to have accomplices to open the door and run through the camp at about 10, 15 miles an hour, throwing out sacks of rice and bags of vegetables and, and whatever. And another big mistake they made was the... the uh, uh, Peace Foundation and uh, the Western uh, ministers uh, were trying to serve these people high protein powder. What does a peasant know of high protein peanut powder? It's ridiculous. They have to eat what they know how to eat, and that's sure. rice and dal and what they call sabji, which is vegetables. Sure. And so that's what I decided to buy, buy them, and and feed them with. So somehow, from feeding people in the park, I ended up feeding people in Bangladesh, right. and then running away from the war when the war started because sure. the Indian police were after me, and I'm trying to figure out what kind of a racket I was running. And they couldn't understand that I would just be trying to feed people. Right. And so I went across India three days on a train and ended up in Goa with thousands of other Americans and Europeans who were suddenly cut off from their money coming from, them, from their families and their sure. friends. And they had to be fed. So we took over a Jesuit monastery on a stone outcropping facing the Arabian Sea. And that had a huge uh, clay oven that had to be fed enormous amounts of wood. And uh, we, uh, we cooked on, uh, on, on the wood stove for uh, hundreds of people a day. It's amazing. 
Uh, you may be cooking in the future again. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, sure. At all, when in your life did you start to touch upon film? Um, I had a lot that of, was your early dream. Huh? I, well, it was an early dream, and I had a lot of friends in film. But I also had an aversion to Los Angeles and an aversion to the film industry. But enough friends of mine were art directors and art department personnel that they kept on, kept on clawing at me. And when I came back from India, I lived in Santa Barbara after living in St. Helena in Marin for a while. I ended up in Santa Barbara and I ended up taking over a health food restaurant that was failing. And uh, where was that located? That was uh, located on Cannon Perdido and Garden Street. It was called the Tea House. And uh, a bunch of lunatics were running it okay. who uh, would only serve raw food. And it happened to have been a cold winter for Santa Barbara. It was cold out. And obviously, people needed hot food and hot soup. So I fired everybody and started it all over again myself. And I found some friends. Uh, they needed jobs, and uh, we changed the menu and started serving uh, hot food sure. as well as salads, and started making homemade pies, and uh, started serving ratatouille, and started serving. Uh, uh, we uh, I quickly jumped to fish and chicken and added that. And in the early seventies, it was very hard to find uh, organic food, sure. but uh, we did our best, and uh, and uh, and we found it, and. Uh, Within six months' time, we went from six employees to 36 employees. Wow. We went from $1,000 a week to $1,000 a meal. Wow. And my deal with the owner was, all right, if I make this thing work, I get 25% and my salary goes up to $500 a week. At the end of six months, this good-natured uh, uh, hippie uh, uh, self-styled guru says, well, Richard, uh, I've got the menu, I've got the staff, I've got the reputation, I've got the business. Why should I sign a contract with you? I said, but Harvey, I can make more money in a movie in a week than I'm making here in a month. This is ridiculous. This is my place, too. I know you started it, and I know you designed it, but this was going down for the third time. You were going to close. It. I saved it. Did I get any credit for that? He said, yeah, thank you very much, pal. So I said goodbye. And I went to work on Cinderella Liberty in Seattle. That a friend of mine was, was art directing. Oh, what and, capacity? Um, just as an art worker, yes. Um, someone that could paint and, and build and, uh, and sure. uh, do various things. And uh, Cinderella Liberty was a fairly popular movie at its time. It was with Marsha Mason and uh, James Caan and Eli Wallach. And um, after the movie was over, I went to visit friends in Canada up in the islands of the Georgia Straits and uh, spent the summer there in the early fall and then came back. To California because California, no matter how beautiful BC was, I was still in love with California. About what year was this? 1973. What and other movies have you worked on? Um, I'm a character actor in Godfather 3. I art directed uh, Halloween 5. I art directed The Principal, but I didn't get credit for it because of bad politics. Uh, they fired the. This is your story. <laughs> and, well, I don't want to write off anybody. But sure. They uh, uh, they fired the production designer, and um, and they wanted me to take over as production designer, and I couldn't do that because he was a friend of mine. Sure. But I had art directed it under him, and uh, the funny thing about it, if you're familiar with the principle, I really lived out the story that James Belushi acts out in the movie, because it was in a black slum by by Children's Hospital on 51st Street, underneath the elevator, the sure. train, and um, the kids that they hired were, were robbing and stealing everything in sight. And, um, and they couldn't, couldn't be, they, they ran off two different crews. Sure. So I showed up with my crew of uh, free carpenters from Marin County and Berkeley, and uh, all of a sudden, everyone understood what was going on, and we told the kids, look, this is an experience you're never going to have again. You're working on a movie. Right. And we're going to show you how a movie is made, but you've got to cooperate. And um, one time I'm walking past a hallway and I smell, I smell reefer. I smell marijuana. And that's what the kids were doing all the time. They were getting instead of working. 
So I grabbed, I grabbed the joint, and I took a toke, and I passed it around, and um, one guy said, geez, I've never smoked any dope with a white man before. I figured all you were cops. <laughs> so I said, no, that's not quite the case. But listen, do like we do. Do it at home. This, we've got to work very hard here. Exactly. We have so many weeks and so much time, time for everything. To, to, to complete the job. Sure. And that's what's happening. So you're teaching, you're and, giving them some experience right. and responsibility and focus and yeah. time frame. And, and as soon as I catch any of one of you again on the job doing this kind of thing, you're gone. Right. And that was it. So we got control. We got control over the thing. And it turned out that all of my people uh, who were well experienced in life and well traveled sure. and, uh, and, and didn't uh, have uh, heavy value judgments. Uh, and certainly weren't racist, sure. uh, were able to get across to these kids. And these sure. kids fell in love with the crew. Yeah, and you and gave uh, them an, a, a window into a world yeah. they never knew existed. Yeah, that's right. Um, I want to I want to bring you back to the Oracle for a moment. Um, I know some, you wrote some articles for yes, the Oracle. Yes, three. And uh, uh, around what period was that? And can you tell me what those articles were? I came on later. I think my first edition was the 7th and that would be Flower from the Streets. Yes. And that's describing Hate Street from, from, from a, a participant's eye view rather than an outsider. Sure. We kept on reading about ourselves in Time and Newsweek and all the other men look and life by, by outsiders, by squares, by adult people in suits were walking around reporting on us and it was ridiculous. Right. And so I wrote it from the inside. Um, and then, oh no, that was the second article. The first article was Indians for Sale. Okay. Where Martine and I and about 10, 12 of us went out to the Hopi land. Oh. To Old Arrivi and Hope Villa. And uh, we saw the petroglyph of the destruction of the earth. With the gore to fire and ash destroying the earth if uh, man doesn't wake up. And the reason why we went though was also because Congress was trying to pass a sneaky little law called the Omnibus Indian Act of 1967, and it was gonna and it was gonna give deeds to all the Indians. So they would all not live the way they're supposed to live, tribally and communally, but live like white people with deeds. And obviously they were out to screw them and sure. buy up the deeds sure. from drunken Indians and sure. end up getting their their reservations and destroying the reservation right. system. They were out to destroy the Indians as they were. Right. So uh, we had we had the meeting with the Hopis, and I came back and wrote an article called "Indians for Sale." And that article got around, and it was read in a lot of it was repeated in all the other underground papers, and eventually bits and pieces of it got into the above ground newspapers, and the act was destroyed. It never happened. That's the amazing. Indians are still on reservations. So when somebody watches this video of fifty, hundred years from now, they can see the difference one person could make. Yes. One person can always make a difference, make a difference, and we should never forget that. What was the third article? The third article was um, only ran for part of the issue, and that was I was leaving for the Pentagon, and so it was about the Pentagon demonstration. Mm -hmm. But the Oracle, we never had, like everything else in the hate ashford we never had enough money. So it was produced in batches. When we had enough money for a batch of so many thousand, we'd run right. a batch. Right. Well, the Pentagon demonstration came and went, so there was no reason to have my angrily written article about what we were going to do and we were going to show hey, them and we were going to sure. pick up the Pentagon and turn it around and so on and so forth. So um, uh, I think Ralph Aper Ackerman was responsible for replacing my article with the uh, Buddha that's in the park. That's right. In the it was donated Golden by, Gate park. by right. Gumps, I right. believe. Right. right. That's right. So not bad no, not to be replaced by Buddha. I didn't no. mind at all. Not at all. And it was the right thing to do because, it, I mean, it was over. It was history. Um, real quickly. Um, I also edited several other articles, one of which was the Buckminster to Fuller article, and um, three or four others who I can't Which article? Which what remember was that about? My head. Well, Bucky Fuller was a very interesting man, and uh, he had no uh, value judgments or constraints on his mind. And he saw this phenomenon out here, and he correctly recognized it as something akin to being in the left bank of Paris in the 1870s or 80s, or the left bank of Paris in the 1920s or 30s, sure. or the American Revolution, or New York in the, in the, in the, during the war, or after the war, and abstract, abstract expressionism Sure, look at the poster born. art. I, I mean, right. think, abstract expressionism and bebop sure. are both in New York in the late 30s through the 40s. Sure. 
And that's an extraordinary confluence of, 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 of time and place where extraordinary people get together. Right. And he recognized that that's what was happening here. And we understood that, that this was an extraordinary time where extraordinary people were getting together. Uh, and perhaps we'll never be historical figures, although I understand I'm in Google somewhere. Yes. Um, but, You're in uh, San Francisco. But we knew that this was very now. special. <laughs> But we knew that this was very special, that very special people were here. And we had conversations and talks and comparisons and books that we had read that I've never had again in my life. What, what kept igniting your passion? Because I, obviously, I mean... It was the people, the people you've already spoken to and thousands of others that were just uh, one of a kind, extraordinary people. If, yeah. I, if, I, if the world would listen to you and would take your advice, what advice would you give the world for the future? Drop everything and live your life. Make sure you're doing what you want to do. Don't compromise. Because uh, uh, well, when you compromise, you lose way too much of yourself. And you'd be surprised how your wife or your husband or your children or the rest of your family will eventually come to understand the action that you've taken. Because many of us, most freaks were outcasts from their family. And we made family amongst ourselves and reformed our family, even though some of us remain alienated from our family all our lives, or at least misunderstood. I was never understood by my family, but it made no difference, because I ended up with a family of thousands. Sure. And, uh, and uh, something like, um, like uh, Thanksgiving in India, with all the other Americans you can find, in a, in a place like Benares, using a goose instead of a turkey, sure. and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the local uh, gourds instead of uh, pumpkins, uh, are extraordinary experiences. And why do we do that? Well, here we are, we're Americans and we're in India. We might as well get together and have Thanksgiving. <coughs> and you find yourself doing a lot of the old things. You're, you're, you never lose your original culture. No. You, you never stop being a Christian or a Jew or an Italian or, or Polish or whatever, but you also become this other person. Sure, you've uh, grown. Yes, you grow. And, you're, and you, you find out that you're everything. You're not nothing, but you're everything that you've ever done and been. Right. And all the people that have influenced you. Exactly. And uh, that's the only way that you can live your life realistically. Especially today, where we're facing a crisis beyond any crisis that we thought we were living in 35 years ago. In the original Do you see hope? Do you see hope for the future? Sure, there's hope. As long as we're alive. As long as we get up the next morning, there's hope. That what? somewhere, somewhere, somehow, uh, either as a group or an individual genius will come along and figure out a plan. Either a Gandhi will be born, or a bunch of people will just get tired of fighting like has happened so many times in Africa and in Europe. Sure. Where they just saw this is ridiculous. We can't, we can't go on like this. Sure. Look how many people in Israel, how many Palestinians and Israelis are working together instead of against each other. Right. And different took organizations. Time. Took time. All the time, trying to knit it back together again. So do you feel what we all came through and where we are now, it was worth it? Oh yes, definitely. We've built some ground? Yes. The world has definitely changed because of who we are and what we did. What are you doing now in your life? Uh, I'm writing a novel that I've been trying to finish for the last 10 or 15 years, and I'm driving a taxi cab at night in Santa Barbara. Like Bill Graham. Like Bill Graham. <laughs> like Bill and Graham. I'm an insomniac, and so I need not drink coffee all night. Sure. And uh, I drive, and I compose my, my novel. My Is it, Does it have a name yet? Father Falafel. Fa Father Falafel? Father Falafel. Well, hopefully when this is watched in years to come, that, that book will be available it's in the written library. To, it's written to be as a movie. Wonderful. So it's, it's a twofer. It's a script and it's a novel at the same time. Wonderful. Yeah. You know, I just want to thank you so thank much you. for coming today. Um, it, you've added so much more information to what we've already had and what we're gaining. And we can do nothing more than document this time. Because this gives value to every single person's life Good. that has contributed, that has made change, and that we hope in the future will inspire more positive I couldn't have some more. Thank, thank you. you.